Okay, good to go, yeah. So, um, we're going to just look at three, the three sort of um, least complex, I suppose, of the membrane transport um, methods. We're going to look at diffusion, facilitated diffusion and active transport. So, these are all methods by which molecules and ions can get into cells. Um, we're going to start with diffusion because it's really easy and it's something you all know about. So what you did at high school was um, you did that diffusion was the random movement of particles, uh, the net movement from a, an area of their high concentration to an area of their low concentration and that, that is still true. Um, as far as you're concerned you need to know about membrane structure and you need to know where that happens. So simple diffusion is happening where the particles are squeezing through between the phospholipids, which are kind of jammed up quite close together. So, as far as um, diffusion is concerned, we need to remember that this layer here is made of is hydrophobic. I keep banging on about this hydrophobic bit; it's important, really. Um, and therefore it won't let anything lipid uh, that's water soluble through it or even polar. So we're talking about things that are small and non-polar. So good examples of those would be uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if you think in your lungs going across your alveoli, they just squeeze those uh, gases are just squeezing between the phospholipids and moving across. You can also take in some other things that are lipid soluble. Now, most things that you're familiar with dissolve in water. They are water soluble. Lipid soluble means they dissolve in lipid and they will dissolve across that hydrophobic layer. So, things that can do that, we're talking about vitamins A, D and E. So these are the ones that can get across the membrane without any difficulty. They're also the ones that we can store in our uh, fatty tissues. And they just dissolve across the bilayer. They don't need anything else to get across. So, factors affecting diffusion haven't changed either. So if you raise the temperature, all the little particles on this side gain some kinetic energy. They collide more frequently with the phospholipid bilayer and slide across. So diffusion rate goes up. Um, if you increase the surface area of the membrane, so we did about microvilli, um, increasing the surface area, there are, there's just more space for them to be able to collide with and slide across and they do that. So increased surface area increases the rate of diffusion and also how high the concentration is on one side compared to the inside. So this is called a concentration gradient. Um, the higher it is on one side relative to the, the low side, the more likely it is that these particles will collide with the phospholipids. So if the concentration gradient is a big one, a high concentration gradient, the rate of diffusion will increase and quite often you'll see that put graphically that means on a graph uh -huh. <laughs> don't start me off so if we put uh, concentration remembering that there is no abbreviation for concentration I don't care what the chemists say just write it out in full we don't look at conks um, and rate of uptake into a cell, so going across a membrane, what we get is a lovely straight line graph. The higher the concentration on the outside, the, uh, the faster the stuff will move in and it will only really be limited by how much surface area there is. So the only other thing to say about diffusion is we refer to it as a passive process. And what passive means is that we don't need any ATP. 
So this is why, I mean, you know, to be fair, diffusion doesn't even need a membrane, does it? You know, people can smell your perfumes and aftershaves uh, just because it's diffusing towards them from your skin. So it doesn't even need a membrane diffusion. Uh, but in biological context, we are always talking about membranes and controlling what goes in and out. So we'll move on to facilitated diffusion now. And facilitated diffusion is, is using these, uh, so we're using a protein, and I'm going to stick to channels. And the reason I'm going to stick to channels is that although you might have carriers that do conformational shape changes but passively is that we're going to use carriers for active transport so just to sort of not get confused we're just going to say that it's happening down protein channels and these channels are specific so they will only take one sort of molecule although watch this space again we're talking about a movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. This time we're talking about polar molecules, sugars, amino acids, and ions, hydrogen, sodium, potassium. So each polar molecule, each ion has its own specific channel protein that it can go through. <coughs> um, We've also got a slight situation here where you, you do kind of need to know about co-transport. So, and the co-transport example that you need to know about, I'm going to do this one in orange, I think, is where you've got a, a protein carrier of some description in that phospholipid bilayer. And co-transport is where one thing kind of pulls another one through. It's like, you know, if I want to go to an art exhibition and I want to go and take my friend who doesn't really like art exhibitions, I grab her by the hand and pull her through the door. Same thing here. So the two things that are transported that you need to know about are sodium ions. And sodium ions pull into the cell, irrespective of the glucose concentration really, uh, glucose molecules. So that's quite handy. So if you eat a Mars bar, it means that you know you can get all of the glucose out of that Mars bar, providing you've got some salt. Don't put salt on your Mars bars. That's my life advice to you. So uh, this is also a passive process. We don't need any ATP. So this will happen as long as there's a concentration gradient. Obviously, if we raise the temperature, the molecules and ions are going to collide with the channels more frequently and cross. Uh, if we raise the concentration gradient, there are going to be more frequent collisions on the high side and they're going to go across more easily. If we've got more surface area to put our protein carriers in, it's going to go, there's going to be more collisions and they're going to go across. But if we do the graph of concentration outside against rate of uptake, it doesn't look quite the same as our original graph. So we'll get this sort of levelling off here. And this is where the protein carriers are full. all of the time. So because they're full all of the time you've got therefore a maximum rate of uptake. So once they're all actually all the time transporting something across they can't go it they can't make it happen any faster. So it's, it's kind of limited by the number of protein uh, carriers. It's also, of course, limited by the type of protein carrier. So if you've got a cell and it doesn't have any um, sodium ion carrier uh, channels, then it, you can't get glucose in because they go over together. So, uh, you know, and if you have got a cell that hasn't got any 
say urea carriers in it, it won't move urea from one side to the other. So that can also um, affect the facilitated diffusion. So then we move to active transport and again you've probably done this at high school. Active transport not only uses a protein carrier, so we're going to call it a carrier this time. Channels will let the things through, they're kind of a passive thing. Protein carrier is much better to describe active transport. And the key thing is that active means that it needs ATP. So in order to move something, ATP is going to have to be broken down into ADP and phosphate. So when you do respiration next year, um, you'll do the structure of ATP this year as a nucleotide. When you do respiration next year, you'll realise that ATP is an energy carrying molecule. The, the TP stands for triphosphate, so effectively it's a, um, it's a molecule with three phosphates attached. If you break the terminal bond between the last two phosphates, some energy is released. So this is an energy consuming process. So active needs energy. And mostly we're talking about from ATP, although you will come across some pumps that use energy from other sources. We tend to call those pumps rather than active transport. So active, energy from ATP. And the reason that we need the energy is because instead of going from high to low, this allows us to move molecules into areas of their high concentration. So really, really handy. And um, they, they used to create imbalances across membranes. So when we do nerves, you'll see that we've got a sodium potassium pump that creates an imbalance of sodium and potassium ions across the membrane. It might be to um, absorb say uh, low concentration ions from soil water into plant roots that goes in by active transport so nitrates usually quite limited in soil um, but it's quite high concentration in the cells and it's that's because it's taken in by active transport and it's also used we've got a thing called secondary active transport where at one side of a cell if you're trying to absorb something from say the lumen of the gut you would actively transport out sodium ions into the basal channels so that you get a low concentration of sodium ions inside which means that you can pull more glucose and sodium ion by facilitated diffusion from the lumen into the cell. Uh, so that's something to, to watch out for. There's a few situations where you might see that happening. So, <clears throat> back to active transport. It utilises energy from ATP. So, experimentally, if you want to know, if you know that sort of, you know, 100 units of an ion or, a, or glucose are moving into the cell and you don't know how much of that is by facilitated diffusion and how much is by active transport, you can check by applying a poison. I love my poisons. And this one's called cyanide. Uh, very topical just at the moment, actually. So um, you might be able to find some news articles about it. So cyanide is um, an inhibitor. So it inhibits the electron transport chain. Again, uh, you'll come across this when we do respiration. It inhibits the electron transport chain on the uh, Christi of mitochondria and stops ATP being made. Obviously you need ATP to carry out active transport, so if you stop it, the active transport can't happen. So graphically, we do our rate of uptake. 
and this time I'm going to put oxygen concentration at the bottom because obviously if ATP production depends on respiration then oxygen concentration, the more oxygen you've got the more respiration you can do, the more ATP you can make and the rate of uptake will go up until all the channels are full. So just a bit like the facilitated diffusion. When all of those protein carriers are going as fast as they can, you've got your maximum rate of uptake. If you then apply cyanide, that rate will drop. Um, at, down to zero if everything's being transported by active transport. So one thing to look out for is if it doesn't drop to zero, so if you apply cyanide and the rate, and um, you've got something like nitrate ions, and the rate kind of levels off there, that means that this much of the uptake is by a passive process. So that would mean it would be by facilitated diffusion or diffusion, depending on what we're taking across. So you can use it to weigh up how much of the uptake is active and how much is passive. So application of cyanide will knock out all of the active transport. Whatever you're left with, whatever else is being transported, will be by a passive method. And I think that kind of covers those three, really.